Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. Like that. (laughs) Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 6. I'm your host, Richard Barons. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is a Nine Muses Books production. This is the only podcast devoted to Lizzie Borden and the Borden murders of 1892. Episode 6. Lizzie Borden Live. thank you goes out to Karen Benedetto for composing and performing our opening song. It was a special treat to open my email last night and find this wonderful contribution. You can learn more about Karen at KarenBenedettoSongs.com. Well, this coming Halloween weekend marks a very special day for Lizzie Borden fans. Lizzie Borden herself will speak once more. She's being resurrected by a very talented actress and playwright, Jill Dalton. Jill wrote Lizzie Borden Live, a one-woman play about our favorite murder suspect back in 2005-2006 and performed it at the East Lynn Theater Company in Cape May, New Jersey. It subsequently went on to open in New York City, Arizona, and Fall River, where it was enthusiastically received by audiences who found it to be a revelation. Meticulously researched, Jill's play has set a high bar for plausible interpretations of Lizzie Borden as a suspected murderer and as a Victorian woman. Set in 1905, just after her sister, Emma Borden, has abandoned her to a solitary life in Maplecroft, the play allows Lizzie Borden to speak candidly in a way that she was never allowed to in real life. Jill gives us a complex Lizzie, alternating between dream reality and memory, confirming and denying our worst suspicions, and finding stunning but plausible nuances of her personality and psyche. The show blew me away in 2007, and now it's back. Jill Dalton and her creative partner, Jack McCulloch, the director of the show, are resurrecting Lizzie Borden Live this Halloween season with performances at Polaris North in New York City at 245 West 29th Street. The performances will be October 28th, the 29th, and the 30th, and best of all, it's free to the general public. More information about the play and how to get tickets is available on their website, lizzieborden.net. 
If you can make it, I guarantee you it will be a wild night of quality theater and a great eye-opener about the real Lizzie Borden. We've invited Jill back on the show, and she's graciously accepted. So let's take a listen and hear her talk about her career, her play, and of course, Lizzie Borden. Oh, hi, Jill. Welcome to the Lizzie Borden podcast. Hi, Richard. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm sorry it took five years to have you back again, but... (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know, that's okay. From the listener's point of view, it's only been six episodes. There you go. But what we're going to do today is we're going to ask you about your new theater production, Lizzie Borden Live, which you'll be performing in late October in New York City. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. We're going to do Lizzie Borden Live for three performances in New York City, like you said. It's going to be Halloween weekend. We're going to do Friday, October the 28th at 7, Saturday, October the 29th at 7, and Sunday, October the 30th at 3. And we're doing it at a little theater space called Polaris North, which is located at 245 West 29th Street on the fourth floor, it's between 7th and 8th Avenues. And it is completely free because Polaris North is a collective of actors, directors, playwrights. We all, you know, auditioned to get into the collective and then we all pay dues. And as part of our membership, we're allowed to do projects there in all different sorts of Levels. So this is actually three performances. And of course, uh, donations are gratefully accepted at the door. And then we're going to have a little reception after each performance, a little wine and cheese. If anyone wants to make reservations, they can email lizzie at lizzieborden.live.net and we'll take your reservation. And you also have a website. Yes, I do, thanks to you. Yes, the website is lizzieborden.live.net, and it is an ongoing thing. I, I need to get back to it now, and I've been doing a, a lot of other things, trying to promote Lizzie, you know, and we did this big Kickstarter campaign, which was a big success. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, I saw you got more than 100% on the Kickstarter. Yeah, we got 124%, so we were so happy. Does that make the receptions possible? to fund those receptions? Yes, it makes the receptions possible. It makes the videographer, we have a videographer who's going to come in for a performance, makes that possible. It makes all the posters, flyers, programs possible. And I had to get a new hairpiece because, uh, you know, my hair's changed color since I did whiskey last time. Yeah, but the thing with Kickstarter is if you don't make your goal, you lose everything. I mean, you get nothing. You don't lose, but you get nothing. Right, you just didn't get funded. Yeah, you just don't get funded and nobody loses any money. They don't take the money until the end. Uh, It was simple to set up, although very time-consuming as all, you know, most of this technical stuff is. You know, as you know, you helped me with the MailChimp program, which I was like, what the heck is, I was calling it monkey mail. (laughs) Monkey mail. (laughs) (laughs) Monkey mail. (laughs) So all these things, it's like a learning curve for me anyway. You can't just sit back and watch the money roll in. You still have to promote. You still have to solicit. Yeah. It's an ongoing process to stimulate people to come visit the Kickstarter page and get it funded. Absolutely. I was on social media every day. Well, Facebook, and I would post, you know, I had a Lizzie Borden page. I have a Jill Dalton page, and I would post off of that every day. I would do a Lizzie Borden. It just so happened, as things do, that we uh, started the campaign on August second and of course the murders were on august 4th and so it was like oh my gosh i didn't even realize that when we did it so it was just kind of perfect did andrew borden make a contribution you know he didn't Uh, the the skin flint (laughs) i know typical right he just was a little too cheap he was like no 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 i'm not giving them any money because they may say something bad about me. you got to cut him out of the play now, if you forgive the pun. Oh, no, I'm not cutting him out of the play, darling. He's way too much fun. (laughs) Well, (laughs) before we we go on about the play in in detail, you have a partner in crime on this play, Jack McCulloch, who is a creative partner in this project. 
Could you tell us a little bit about Jack? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Jack, my partner in crime. Well, he's directing the piece. He and I have worked together a long time, since 2000. And he had directed a couple of, uh, well, he directed my one-woman show, My Life in the Trenches. He and I met on Law and Order Criminal Intent. We were both detectives in the squad room. And he had come to see a little production that I did of my life in the trenches. And, you know, then we started working together. And he's a graduate of Trinity Rep. And he had worked with Adrian Hall there. He was in, he was a member of the company for like eight years. So he and I have a lot of similar background things with being in theater. And so we just started working together. And he uh, he got so involved with Lizzie. I mean, he freaking loves Lizzie. He defends her to the end of the earth. It's like he's her soulmate from another realm. Well, one synchronicity you found out is that he was born and raised in Fall River. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, that would be one. Yeah, absolutely. There's that. From what I remember, you mentioned Lizzie Borden first to him, and then he freaked out and said, oh my God, I grew up in Fall River. Yeah, and I have synchronicity with uh, Lizzie in other ways, because what I have are dates. For example, uh, Lizzie was born on July 19th. My niece, Taylor, was born on July 19th. My sister hates that, but it's true. Sarah Morris Borden, Lizzie's biological mother, died on March 26th, and March 26th is my mother's birthday. A.J. Borden married Abby Durfee Gray on June 6th. That's his second wife, right? The stepmother to Lizzie and Emma. Uh, So that happened on June 6th, and that happened to be my wedding anniversary as well. And then Lizzie died in Fall River on June 1st, and my mother died on June 1st. So Yeah, that's pretty uh, Twilight Zone material there. Right? I know. Well, fortunately, your uh, father and stepmother were not hatcheted to death on August 4th. Thank God for that. That would have been a little bit too much. I think it would have been too close to home for me to write this play and, and work on it. Yeah, sometimes those date things are really eerie. Well, we're going to backtrack a little now and talk about the genesis of the play, because at first you didn't feel a bit of a simpatico with Lizzie Borden. In fact, the opposite. When it was first mentioned to you, you had an adverse reaction to it. So can you tell us about who mentioned it to you first and for what purpose and what came out of that proposal? Yes, I was having Christmas dinner with Gail Salhouse, who is the artistic director director of the Eastland Theatre Company in Cape May, New Jersey, and her husband and a few other people. And Gail also has written solo shows and performed them, and she'd seen a few of my shows. And, and she said, oh, Jill, I have a great idea for a solo play, and I'd really like for you to consider writing it. And I was like, sure, what is it? She said, Lizzie Borden. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Because all I <laughs> All I knew about Lizzie was, you know, a little ditty. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax, blah, blah, blah. When she saw it. So I was like, no, I don't need a homicidal maniac running around in my head. I, I, can't, I can't handle that. And she was like, well, just think about it. Just think about it. I said, okay, sure. So I immediately forgot about it and went about my business. And then like a week later, Gail calls me and she goes, so what did you decide? And I go, well, wait a minute. Are you serious? She said, yes, I'm serious. And, you know, I'll commission you. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll pay you to write it. And I was like, okay, let me check this out and get back to you. So I started doing a lot of research. That helps, right? Once yeah. you're, oh, we're going to get paid to write a play? Wait a minute. Excuse me? What did you just... I don't think I heard that correctly. <laughs> so Never I started happen. doing Never research. Never happens. Never yeah. happens. Very rarely, right? So I did research and I was like, you know what? I'm not feeling any really bad vibes. I don't feel like she's going to haunt me at night. I don't feel like, you know, I'm just not getting any of that. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And I and I really, I knew nothing about her. Nothing, really, except for that silly nursery rhyme. I knew, I knew nothing. So I had to learn. I just had to submerge myself. And then that freaking trial, that's like 1,900 pages or something, had just been put up online. And so I, I had to read that whole thing twice. Yeah, at LizzieAndrewBorden.com, Stephanie Corey has put up free PDFs of the entire trial, the police statements, I believe her uh, Pear Tree Press sells the preliminary hearing 
but the trial is online, and yes, it, it's a well over a thousand pages. Yeah, it's it's you know mammoth, especially when you don't know anything. I mean, now I can go back and I was reading certain parts of it, and I was like, you know what, this is fast, so much more fascinating to me now, just because I know so much more. When you first read it, you're kind of. Uh you're kind of trapped in this labyrinth where you're trying to put all the puzzle pieces together. But once you have that larger picture in your head and you go back and you could relax and just, you know, you already have that base now. You could focus on, on detail and it's it's much more liberating to do that. But you have to go through that initial hurdle of climbing that mountain. Yes, and it was a huge hurdle and a huge mountain. And plus I had a deadline and I didn't have that much time. She wanted it up and running in August of um, 07. And this was, I, I believe it was, Christmas dinner 06? Could that even be possible that I did it in that amount of time? Yeah, because my, my review of the hatchet was uh, in the summer of 07. So you must have been writing, writing and, and uh, preparing for it in 06. Yeah, amazing. Just backtracking a little bit, Gail, she does favor portraits of Victorian women. I mean, there was uh, one woman that she specializes in. Is it Louisa May Alcott? Yes, I think that's right. Louisa May Alcott. Uh, Gail has done a one woman Louisa May Alcott show. So I think she also sensed Lizzie Borden as a character, a, a three dimensional character that was worth exploring and worth basing a one woman show around. And probably felt that you yeah. were the, the, you know, you impressed her as an actress and that you were the best person to do it and that you had experience with playwriting. Yeah, I just believe that things come into our life for a reason. It wasn't, it may seem random, but actually it's not random. And now I know when something like that comes to me to pay attention to it and honor it, because obviously that was, Lizzie wanted to make an entrance in a different way. You know, she's always been portrayed as this crazed maniac. I mean, look at the Lizzie Borden Chronicles. You know, she was like a serial killer crazed person and when I read things I I just didn't want to do that I wanted to be as honest I didn't want to exploit her it seems like everyone exploits Lizzie and I didn't want to do that I wanted to do it from her point of view and what happened to her was a huge catastrophe so I was looking at it from a different point of view and hoping that I could speak as, as much as I could from her, her side of the equation and look at what happened to her. And what I discovered was I felt that the biggest catastrophe in Lizzie's life was not the murders, but the fact that Emma moved out of, out of the house that they bought after, you know, with the father's inheritance money after Lizzie was acquitted, and then 13 years later, Emma moved out of the house. And I felt that that was the biggest catastrophe in Lizzie's life since Emma had been her surrogate mother and her confidant and her everything. So that's what came to me as I was reading all this information. I was like, oh my gosh, everybody focuses on the murders, but in reality, this is the tragedy of, of Lizzie's life. And the fact that they never spoke together for the to, you know, the end of their days and died nine days apart. In 1927. Yeah. So they spent... Um, uh, sh Emma Borden left Maplecroft in 1905. Yes. And they both died in 1927, uh, presumably not having spoken to each other or communicated during that time. Or if they did communicate, it was probably through lawyers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because they, they still had real estate holdings and business together. Yeah. Now, your play, Lizzie Borden Live, as the version that I saw... Uh, as recently as 2008, takes place in Maplecroft after the departure of Emma Borden in 1905. Correct. So dramatically, Lizzie has just been uh, experienced that abandonment. And it's a time for reflection. She's alone in Maplecroft, and uh, she is aware of the audience and starts monologuing to them. And the monologue leads to a, a series of flashbacks, a series of forays into Lizzie's mind, and tells the story of Lizzie Borden and the murders and the trial and the aftermath and her life in Maplecroft up to 1905 through this woman reminiscing in her house. And that's the dramatic structure of the play. And it, within, that, within that structure, uh, I was impressed with how you were able to create this very plausible, subjective experience of this woman, Lizzie Borden. Uh, is that something that when you say that you, you worked with the trial transcripts and spent so much time plowing through this, you had to work through the entire crime 
But then there's an equal amount of material in the play about her her life after the murders in Maplecroft. Where did you get that material? <laughs> well, some of it was from, you know, like newspaper articles, like the when I start the show now, it has a, a bit of a different opening. But, you know, the newspaper uh, article that came out, I, I think it was June 3rd, uh, 1905, uh, saying that, you know, Emma had moved out of the French Street home, and the rumors were uh, that Emma was not happy with Lizzie entertaining Nance O'Neill and her theatrical troupe there due to carryings on in the home. So that sparked a whole, my imagination. And so then I started learning about Nance O'Neill and their relationship. So I set it up so that Lizzie, uh, now that Emma, uh, Emma's gone, I, I set it up so that Lizzie is planning this big, big party for Nance O'Neill and her theatrical uh, troupe. Probably a, a big holiday Christmas party is what I'm thinking. And I played off of that. And, you know, any time I could find the actual words, either from Lizzie or, suppo- you know, supposedly by Lizzie, I mean, I don't know. And any time I could use the words from the transcript of the trial, I would use those. And, you know, I kind of had to, well, one of the things I read, uh, you know, about Nance O'Neill when Nance O'Neill was interviewed later about uh, Lizzie Borden, and Nance was like, well, we were just ships passing in the night. But to me, as Lizzie, uh, and Lizzie now alone in that house being abandoned, I felt that Lizzie was putting everything into Nance O'Neill. She was going to create this whole new life for herself where she was now free of Emma, who was, you know, against these parties and and didn't like the attention that, and the whispering about, you know, it's bad enough that we have these murders to contend with. And now Lizzie is, you know, entertaining theatricals in their home. So I saw it as Lizzie is going, okay, I'm free, and this is what I'm going to do, and this is who I am now, and I go to the theater, and I entertain these people, and I do all these fabulous things, and then, of course, that falls through, too. But in Lizzie's mind, I, you know, it's almost like a, a woman who fantasizes about a boyfriend, you know, oh, and we're going to do, and the, and, the, and the guy is like, yeah, I know her, and, you know, we're friends, and yeah, you know, we've, and Lizzie, my gosh, she was giving Nancy O'Neill money. Uh, supposedly she was writing a play for her. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but so there, there was, uh, there were things going on between them. I don't know that they were having a lesbian affair like everybody thinks or some people think. I don't know about that because I see Lizzie as more, I just don't know if that's a possibility, but you know. I think the story of Lizzie Borden and Nance O'Neill is far more fascinating without the lesbian theory. Yes, I do too. Yeah, it's, it's if you read the uh, revelations that came out in Parallel Lives by the Full River Historical Society, the material that we now have on Nance O'Neill and Lizzie Borden, I think it, it lends itself to much more deeper uh, uh, character interaction if, if if you look at it from a dramatic point of view, you're right. The stuff about about the theater group getting money from Lizzie Borden, there was even a lawsuit where Lizzie Borden was trying to get her money back. But even if there had been some sort of erotic relationship between the two, certainly there was a falling out. And it was a falling out not just between Lizzie and Nance, but Lizzie and the theater company. They they seemed to be a bit perplexed you know, by their relationship to Lizzie. But it started innocently enough with Lizzie Borden showing up at the stage door with a bouquet of flowers, trying to get Nance O'Neill's friendship. And she did throw parties for her, and she did invite the theatricals into her home, which I, I bet didn't bode well with the neighbors. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding? <laughs> she had a jazz band. Oh. Like or I guess whatever the word was for jazz back then. I, I believe the story is much more compelling and would make for better drama without the lesbian component. Well, that's the way I felt about it, and uh, it just didn't ring true for me, the whole lesbian thing. So I didn't, I mean, I have that part in there when I talk about how the tongues of gossip have been wagging. You know, everyone thinks, oh, what is this, a Boston marriage? You know, oh, lovers, blah, 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 blah. So I do address it, but I I kind of leave that all to the audience. The audience can make their own decisions. Yes. They can decide if all that stuff, if, if, if they had a relationship like that or if they did didn't, or if Lizzie uh, murdered her parents, or if they, or if she didn't, you know, I really just let the audience. Uh, I don't try to tell them 
you know, I let people make their own decisions. Because if you read most of the books on Lizzie Borden that were available in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, most of them are really uh, true crime paperbacks and books that were yes. written by people who spent so little time on the case, they just wanted to really get a bestseller out of it. There was a lot that we didn't know. They were outsiders to Fall River. People in Fall River tended to be very insular and very loyal to Lizzie. So it's the Historical Society and people like Michael Martins and Dennis Binet who have courted Fall River residents for years and decades, gaining their trust, hearing their stories, seeing their personal collections. Those are the people who are qualified to really give us more information about Lizzie Borden. So the, the books that were not written by people like uh, Martins and Binet are people uh, who have written lurid crime paperbacks, who have tried to have their own pet theory about who did it. You know, Bridget did it. Uncle John did it. You know, That's uh, right. It was suicide. That's what I discovered when I started doing research, and I got so angry and frustrated and that's when i went to the trial i was like you know what these people have no idea and they're i I knew it was sensationalizing her and exploiting her and like you said trying to write a bestseller and coming up with some bogus theory about what happened and that's why i said i i need to go to primary sources and look there because even the newspapers they were just printing just like today printing bullshit a lot of the time. Yeah. They just would make it up. Or, you know, they didn't care. They didn't do the research either. Or, you know, it was gossip, innuendo. And, you know, that was one of the things that I put in the play also because, you know, it's infuriating. And when, you know, when you see how, you know, it's like the Jean Benet Ramsey case where they those parents were tried in the press and found guilty. And literally the mother died of cancer, you know, within 10 years. They had to leave their home, their hometown. Every, they had to, and then, two years after the mother dies, DNA clears both of them. And so all of that is just the bullshit that the press puts out to sell papers, and it destroys people's lives. And I tried to bring that aspect into the play as well, that Lizzie's still being hounded by the reporter. She's still, especially now that Emma's moved out and this article has come in, and also how, you know, the whole townspeople, people turn against her and shun her and the, the kids knocking on the door and doing the little nursery rhyme thing. One, th- one thing I found drop-dead hilarious in the play, I don't want to give away too much of the play's material because I think people should experience it on their own. But one thing I found drop dead hilarious was when the kids come by and they start singing Lizzie Barton Tuck and X and she <laughs> she legitimately gets mad, chases them away, but as she's chasing them away, she's correcting them. You know, it was eleven blows, not forty one. <laughs> It's so important to her. I mean, she she obviously is uh, angry that they're singing this song, but she's also angry that they got it wrong. <laughs> it was a it was a hatchet, not an axe. That is hilarious. Yeah, yeah it's pretty funny. That's the Lizzie of oh, the play. Oh, you have to have some humor in the play. That's what I realized. Come oh, on, yeah. we can't just all be up there like with this horrible dirge about my life sucks and I'm a victim. No, she's you know. She's also angry that in the in the newspaper they got her age wrong. Yes, exactly. <laughs> How dare they do that? <laughs> well, Jill, we're going to take a quick break and listen to a word from Nine Muses Books. Be back in a minute. Nine Muses Books is proud to sponsor the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Nine Muses Books is an independent press featuring the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series written by author Richard Behrens. These well-crafted comic mysteries set a fictionalized Lizzie as a teenage detective against a real Victorian-era Fall River, Massachusetts. The characters are remarkably vivid. The narrative is intellectually stimulating, and as one critic has described it, author Richard Behrens really knows how to toss delightfully deceptive literary curveballs that keep the reader mystified until just that penultimate perfect moment. Michael Martins of the Fall River Historical Society has called these stories a must-read for all those intrigued by Fall River history, mystery, and, of course, Lizzie Borden. Shelley Diesick of the Lizzie Borden Warps and Wefts blog has written that the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective stories are so much fun, it's nearly criminal. The Lizzie Borden Girl Detective mysteries can be found on Amazon in ebook format, and most books are offered as free downloads. In addition to these short stories, there is also the full-length novel, The Minuscule Monk, offered in both print book and ebook format. 
When a dead body mysteriously appears in the basement of her father's furniture store, 15-year-old Lizzie Andrew Borden takes on the case. Accompanied by an eccentric millionaire who campaigns to extend the vote to animals, a Boston Terrier trained to sniff out crooked politicians, and a boy detective who believes that the entire universe is inside his own head. Lizzie follows a trail of taxidermy tools and Civil War bushwhackers to the minuscule monk, a legendary gunslinger whose mummified body will bring a punter's pot to anyone who can deliver it to the New York gangster who has been hunting the monk for decades. With such high stakes, everyone has a motive for murder, yet everyone seems innocent. History and mystery fans alike will find the minuscule monk a thoroughly engaging read. For more information, go to lizzieborden.girldetective.com and sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, and listen to our podcasts on iTunes. Visit the Garden Bay Films channel on YouTube to see special visual editions of the podcast as well as the Lizzie miniseries. And now, back to the Lizzie Borden podcast. Okay, we're back. We're talking to Jill Dalton, playwright and actress, about her play, Lizzie Borden Live, which she will be performing at Polaris North in New York City on October 28th, 29th, and 30th. More information about the play could be found at lizziebordenlive.net. The performance is free to the public and worth the effort to make it to New York to see the play. Jill gives a tour de force performance as Lizzie Borden, commanding the stage with Lizzie's memories, dreams, and hallucinations, and an all-too-human interpretation of this very controversial woman. Well, when I when I first saw the play, I mean, I was I was uh, five years into my uh, Lizzie Borden studies when I saw the play, and the play really opened things up for me. Even though I knew it was your interpretation, it was drama, but it seemed so plausible. It seemed like you had used everything you knew about human nature to craft this woman and that it for the play that works dramatically very well. I wanted to know that, you know, between the first incarnation of the play in the uh, what do we call it? The the knots, not five, not six, not seven, not eight during those years. That was the first incarnation of the play. And now yeah. you have a new incarnation of the play. And what happened in between these two incarnations was the publication of Parallel Lives. That's yeah. the book by the uh, Fall River Historical Society that gave us a mm -hmm. wealth of information, not just about Lizzie Borden, but Fall River in general at that time period. Uh, was there yeah. any material in that book that struck you, that made you want to rethink things, that made you go back to the play and craft it differently or, or add to it or take away from it? Could you say something about that? Well, you know what? Uh, when I read those parts... In Parallel Lives, I was not thinking about redoing uh, Lizzie Borden Live. I thought I was done with that, and I was now, you know, I was writing another, uh, writing, I, I, you know, I wrote two other plays since then, and they were both uh, semi-finalists at the Eugene O'Neill uh, Theater Conference. So I had moved on. So Jack brought this up that, hey, let's, you know, re-look at Lizzie and do that. I was like, what? But I, I did. I started doing that. But what I, uh, what happened was I found this other book, the Lizzie Borden Murders, you know, by Sarah uh, Miller. Sarah Miller, yes. Yeah. And I started reading that. And, you know, I know that she worked with the Historical Society and doing all that and researching. And I started reading that, and it was written in such a understandable, readable, likable way that I pulled things out of there that I was like, oh, okay, I didn't realize that, and I didn't realize this. And, you know, the whole thing about the whole mutton theory of everyone said it was mutton, and then she was like, well, actually, it was probably the swordfish. <laughs> swordfish, <laughs> because, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was a swordfish because they'd eaten it uh, for dinner and supper on Tuesday. So things like that, I started pulling out and making things more specific where where I could, bringing in stuff from the trial that, like from the dressmaker, Mrs. Giffords, I guess, because uh, I have a thing in the play where Lizzie calls Mrs. Borden a, a mean old thing. And then I went back and I looked at the trial because I remembered that one of the dressmakers or somebody had made a comment, you know, testified that Lizzie had called Mrs. Borden a mean, good for nothing. So I, I put things like that in and how the press had referred to Lizzie as the sphinx of calmness. The press was really down on her saying that she was play acting and that she had no feelings. And now they say that. So 
I tried to bring in things that made it more specific to the piece. And also, I, when I played Lizzie before, I saw her as a victim, kind of. And this time, I don't see her as a victim. Like, uh, the ending is has a different bit of a resolution than than before. You know, she's not beaten down by it. I mean, she is momentarily, but you know what? She's going to stay in Fall River because that's the truth. She did stay in Fall River and yeah. she could have gone anywhere. You know, and some of the things I left, like when I learned that, okay, so Lizzie was the morphine stuff with Lizzie, right? And supposedly the the dosage that Dr. Bowen was giving her really wasn't that much to affect her in such a way. But you know what? I like the morphine stuff so much. <laughs> and so do people. They go, oh my gosh, that's really amazing. And the music and, you know, you've got Larry Hawkman's music there that was written specifically for those passages. So I was like, you know what? Because I also thought, okay, me, if I had just gone through that and my uh, father and stepmother were bludgeoned to death and I discovered my father, I could see where I would be in an altered state of consciousness so that even though he might have given me a smaller amount of morphine, I could see where I would be having an out-of-body experience when I am being, you know, on this, you know, at the inquest testimony for three days being hounded by this Hosea Knowlton who wants to see me hung by my neck till dead. I could see having an out-of-body experience, not knowing what to do or what to say, not wanting to say the wrong thing and therefore saying all kinds of crazy stuff. So for me, I can justify it that way. And also in the courtroom, I can see that being an out-of-body experience where I'm on trial for murder and now they're going to tell me if I'm guilty or not. Right. So, you know, I can see being in that heightened state and so I don't really care. It's like a dramatic license or whatever. I don't really care. Oh, I totally agree. As I as I famously tell the tale, I was once on morphine for a few months because I broke a leg in a really bad way, and it, it it's it's you you you're in a you're in a dreamlike state at some points, and it it doesn't have to be very much, and it doesn't have to be that dramatic. But you're absolutely right. Added to that, the pressures of being on the witness stand, the pressures of someone like Knowlton coming down on you like a big bear. You know it. it and, and knowing that what you say or don't say or say wrong or say inaccurately or one slip of the tongue could send you to the gallows. It's amazing she held up as well as she did. So with this new version of the play, you have a slightly different understanding of Lizzie Borden as a person that you could craft into a dramatic persona. Yes, because you know what? I didn't want to, I said to Jack, look, if, if I'm going to do this piece again, I have to come at it from ground zero. I cannot, I just have to look at it with fresh eyes. I cannot just get up there and do what I did before and be like an imitation of an imitation of something that I kind of remember from five years ago and was the last, whenever the last time I did it. So I really just wanted to start from nothing and I would just do it like, uh, like I knew nothing about her and just try to just be as simple as possible and just say the words so I could see how it affects me now because I'm older now and you know it's, it's just different so I've, I've been working on that and also I realized and this is from Parallel Lives and I had this image of Fall River which was that it was this small little do nothing lazy town but in reality it was a thriving crowded you know they had the mills there there's a lot going on so I had to ch reframe that and rework that into the piece as well. I mean, Lizzie still d doesn't like Fall River in my, you know, at a certain point, you know, after she comes home from Europe. But I had to reestablish that in the play and in my mind because it was a, it was totally different than, you know, what I was thinking Fall River was. In the original play, I believe you, uh, you have Lizzie say that she refers to it as provincial mill town. Yes. And uh, I don't know if you changed that line, but from her perspective, that could be an accurate subjective statement. And you know what? I left that. But before, I had like small, whatever I said, and now I have like noisy, crowded 
smelly provincial mill town. Uh, Because to her mind, it is a provincial mill town because she's just come back from 19 weeks in frickin' Europe. And it's also a very puritanical town. It's dominated by the Congregationalists. New England Congregationalists uh, have a very particular, back then, had a very particular attitude towards life that Lizzie seemed to be trying to emerge from and grow larger than. Yeah, I think that's very true. I mean, she, you know, she loved the theater. She wanted to, she wanted to experience life in a, in a bigger way and in a more, you know, she loved the art. She loved artists. They're trying to keep her in a certain role and how she's supposed to be. And you know what? Once she bought that home and got the inheritance, she was a free woman, really. And that was very rare back then. Women, you're the property of your father or your husband You have really no right, and she did. And she inherited also the business. She got the real estate, the real estate holdings, and other properties that Andrew Borden had. Uh, Because she was acquitted of the crime, her and Emma inherited all, not just the money, but the business and the property. Well, Well, I have to say in general, you did an extraordinary job with the first incarnation of the play, and I really look forward to seeing the second. Oh, good. And I'm sure after I perform it, I'm sure other information, you know, just by me experiencing it like that in front of an audience that always informs it and I'm sure other information will come to light like someone will say something like you know oh did you know blah 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 and then I'll go because that's (laughs) (laughs) that's You know, supposedly the only way a play is ever finished is if you put it in the drawer yeah. and ignore it, which is what I did for several years. But obviously it wanted to come back in a more researched way, even though I did tons of research before, little things here and there. Yeah, well, you, you were working with the same restrictions at the time as many other Lizzie Borden researchers, and you were starting from scratch. So considering that, I saw the original play as far more plausible and historically and psychologically accurate than a lot of other play productions. Most play productions are either going to try to identify a murderer. Most play productions are going to turn Lizzie into a far more grisly character and show the murders. Uh, By play, I also include film. So we have the Elizabeth Montgomery movie and the Christina Ricci portrayal, which uh, I I believe uh, both are of varying quality. But they both uh, have, as I know, a whole generation of people who, when you say who's Lizzie Borden, if they know more than the Diddy, what they what they know is uh, the Elizabeth Montgomery image of her committing the acts, the hatchet murders in the nude. Yes, that's what people. Yes, and that stays in your imagination. But even the the Elizabeth Montgomery movie is a dramatic portrayal. I've seen it recently, and I was surprised at how much of it was really okay. How much of it, you know, fit what we knew. She is such a good actress. I mean, people don't realize that about her because she's so beautiful. She is a stellar actress. And and I, I saw it, well, I haven't seen it since I originally started working, you know, doing research on this. But I felt that her performance held up today. Yeah. Absolutely. It does. She had sort of like a creepy reserve. Yeah. You know, as an actor, sometimes you, you say, well, you have a secret and you... You don't tell the audience that you have it, and I felt like she definitely had a secret and she wasn't letting us in on it, which made for very interesting viewing. And the Christina Ricci performance, I I felt that, yes, she did have a secret, but we, the audience, could see right through it. Yes. And it's it's a contrived media ratings-driven, demographics-driven performance. (laughs) Yeah, and you know what? The show was canceled anyway because it was so bad. And some of the things that they did, I mean, I tried to watch it because I was like, oh, you know, keep an open mind. Let's see. There's probably some good here. I mean, they did such stupid things, things about the story that were so interesting. They completely changed them. And I was like, why would you change? It's like they did no research or if they did, they didn't care. They said, you know what? Who cares? We're just going to do it as crazy and as outlandish and as ghoulish and as we don't care. And you know what? The audience didn't care either. So there, the audience said, you know what? Big bore. I see a whole cluster of TV shows that are similar in spirit in terms of graphic violence like Dexter which is about a serial killer Bates Motel which is about a serial killer uh, American Horror Story which is very graphic you know and I think Lizzie Borden Chronicles 
is fitting in with that genre. It's not about Lizzie Borden. It's about that genre. So they have to have a, they, they're desperate uh, to have more hit shows about serial killers. So they turn Lizzie Borden into an extreme sadistic serial killer who kills what? Like two or three people per episode. <laughs> Each episode, the murders had to top the one before. They had to be more grisly, more grotesque, more disturbing. You know, I waited episode after episode after episode waiting for a reference to the mills in Fall River. And there were just a handful. And they were they were just yeah. throwaway lines. It it seemed like if you say what is Fall River? If if you look at that TV show, you get the impression that Fall River was no better than like the mining camp in Deadwood. Right. It was a very demographics driven show. Uh, the the Elizabeth Montgomery movie is very dated in many ways, and there's some yeah. really big gaffes in it where they could have done better research. But they got the spirit right. You know, for all its 1970s made for TV movie affectations and. You know, Andrew Borden cutting up corpses in the basement. Oh, yeah. You know, or Lizzie Borden in the nude or, or uh, you know, the when Bridget's running across the street to get Dr. Bowen, you can see the Hollywood Hills in the background. <laughs> for for all those bloopers and gaffes, they, it's true. <laughs> I didn't it's, even realize that. No, she runs out of the house and you see the, you know, California mountain ranges in, in the background. That's hilarious. For all those gaffes, the, mo- the movie is educational. Like, I taught a class on Lizzie Borden at Keats State College, and I showed uh, large parts of the movie, pausing to explain to them, like, what's true and what's not true. And, and we were just surprised at how, you know, they, they when they were at the trial sequences, they took dialogue from the trial. When they were at the inquest, they took dialogue from the inquest, and they, they generally got it right. I was impressed. I mean, obviously, it only has, like, a, maybe, like, a 60% accuracy rating. But the Christina Ricci movies, the, the movie and the TV show, I think, had, like, a 10% accuracy rating. I can understand people just purely being entertained by it. I can never fault anyone for being entertained by someone or or they feel that it works for them. And I'm not just purely basing it on they didn't get this right, they didn't get that right. But at the very least, you want them to try to make a dramatic effort to craft a plausible Lizzie. And if you're going to craft her as a serial killer, there wasn't a Lizzie Borden serial killer. There was a, an attempt to cash in on the success of shows like like American Horror Story and Dexter. Yeah, you know, they were sense. They were cashing in on the success of a genre. So Lizzie Borden people are vastly, in general, vastly disappointed with it. And it, it didn't serve any purpose. You know, it didn't help any. It didn't help us you know, arrive at any deeper truths or put some very disturbing images in my head that I really didn't like. Well, that was me. I was just like, I can't even watch this. What is it? What purpose does this serve at all? I mean, I just finally was like, this is just so, for me anyway, like lame. I was like, I don't like all that violence anyway. Like American Horror Story, they have great story, great acting, great, but I can't, I have to close my eyes and not look at half of the show because it's horrifying. Yeah. Well, I find that modern horror is uh, primarily based on sadism. Yes, absolutely. There's a absolutely. huge element of sadism in modern horror, yes. which which makes things very, very different. I, I'm a big fan of the horror genre and, and especially in horror literature. Uh, but my preference is like pre-Stephen King because a lot of the more modern stuff, there's uh, there's a huge amount of sadism. Oh, yeah, and they're, they're um, sociopaths. They're sociopaths. They have no conscience. Yeah. Look at Breaking Bag, sociopath. I mean, you know, but I mean, so are our elected officials. Most of them are sociopaths, too. It's like we honor them. We salute them. We're like, oh, my gosh, what a great person. They can murder, you know, millions of people overseas and not blink an eye. They just use those drones. And I mean, our whole society has just become so desensitized. That's what I didn't like about the Lizzie Borden Chronicles, exactly what you just said. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I, I, I see Hello. A, I see a big connection between the two. Uh, but listen, uh, tell us something about yourself. I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember you saying that you were born in Tokyo. Yes, I was born in Tokyo, Japan, because after World War II, the United States occupied. I was born in occupied uh, Japan Yeah. because uh, we were occupying that country, as we are so wont to do. And... Um, and because of that, I was not a United States citizen until I was 13 years old. Um, yeah, I had to come back and be naturalized. And, and I can never be president of the United States, which broke my heart at the time. I think I was like nine, and I was like, what? <laughs> I can't be president? 
but I want to be the first woman president. That's horrible. But whatever, you have to <laughs> say and you yeah. So now I wouldn't want to be president ever. But um, yeah, so uh, military background. I lived in, you know, went to high school in Germany. You told me that you were a cheerleader in Hitler Stadium. I was a cheerleader in Hitler Stadium at Nuremberg. We, I mean, it was crazy. We would have people protesting. Here we are, the Nuremberg Eagles, right? And we're all these snotty-nosed American kids who are so self-involved and self-important. And, you know, we won the war. You're, you know, you Germans are so bad. And here we are, you know, two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar. And there's, I'm looking up and I'm seeing like, oh, that's where Hitler stood. And then there would be um, protesters out in front. Uh, not a lot of protesters, but people, you know, some of the Germans did protest that we were playing football in that stadium, you know. And yeah, so I was a cheerleader. This is where Triumph for the Will was filmed. Yes, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been yeah. very strange. It was kind of surreal. It was, yeah. I remember thinking, this is really weird, but okay, whee! you know, jump up and down and shake my pom-poms, whatever. So then, you know, we moved back to the States, and I had that feeling like Lizzie had. When, I, when we moved back to the States, my father was stationed at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, in Columbia, which is like, it has the, nick, the nickname for Columbia is the screen door to hell, because that's how hot it is there. And... I saw it as so backward. There were no hippies. This is right, or, or mod. I guess it was mod then. It was right before the hippies came in. But everything was very mod in Europe, and everything was the animals and the beetles. And, you know, we were cool over there, and the guys had kind of longish hair. And, you know, and I, I moved to South Carolina, and everybody was doing the shag and dancing to James Brown, who used to play at our local club. And I was like, oh, my God, this is horrible. What is wrong with these people? <laughs> I mean, eventually they caught up. But I was like, oh my, and so I had to try to fit in, and because that's what you do as an army brat, you got you got to look at the lay of the land. Okay, uh, they don't wear bell bottoms here. Okay, they wear little Papagallo shoes, little, you know, uh, alpaca sweaters with their initials on it, and, you know, so you have to do, I was like, okay, I better reinvent myself, because everybody thought I was German, because I came there in my black watch plaid, you know, uh, shirt dress with my navy blue uh whatever stockings and and regions and they were like oh so so like you're german and i'm like no i'm like an army brat leave me alone <laughs> so i hated columbia south carolina and uh with a passion and, and i could not wait to get out of there because my whole goal was to move to new york city come hell or high water i had to get to the you know to the freedom land is the way i saw new york i had to be free you know, I mean, we didn't even have women's lib yet when I was there. That, I mean, it was, like, so horrible. And then, finally, you know, I went to the University of South Carolina because we didn't even know about college. My parents were like, yeah, yeah, whatever, college. I, I was like, but I want to go to college. And they were like, yeah, okay, that's a local school that... My tuition was $235 a semester. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, real expensive. So I went there for four years, then I went to graduate school there, and I just kept saving my money. i got to get out of here. And then I moved to New York, and you know I've been here ever since. Well, you, you, you started a mime company. Oh, yeah, down south I had a mime company. We called it Homemade Mime, and we were actually funded by the National Endowment, believe it or not, when they actually did funding, and the South Carolina Arts Commission. We were very, very successful and toured all around, and we toured colleges and uh, you know, even elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. And then we were offered a national tour and everybody except me said, well, Oh, a national tour. No, I, I can't leave. I can't do this. I can't do that. So I was like, well, why were we doing all this? I thought we wanted to, okay. So everything fell through. I hired, I mean, I auditioned other people, but there was nobody like our company. We had a piano player who was awesome. The guy, Eddie Cole, who was the, the male mime in the group, was fantastic. There was not another mime like him. He was so amazing, and he was beautiful. And when I said, okay, this is our big chance, he was like, you know, I'm going to go uh, do ballet now. And I'm like, but you don't know ballet. No, I'm going to study in Tennessee, and I'm going to become a ballet dancer. I'm like, but you're 20 six years old. 
you're too old to be a ballet dancer. This is, what are you doing? It was like fear or something. So everything just dissipated. And that's when I said, all right, I got to get out of here now because everything I was working on and working for just was disintegrating before. It did disintegrate before my eyes. And then the South Carolina Arts Commission got mad at me because they were like, we put all this money into your mind company company and now you're not a mine company and I'm like I know I'm sorry they all left did you mime the middle finger in front of them I should have <laughs> but no I didn't and that's the point at which you went to New York to pursue an acting career yes because I'd always wanted to be an actress because in my age group before you know women's live and everything as a young girl you could be a mother you could be a librarian, you could be a teacher, you could be an actress, you could be a hooker. That's the way I saw it. Those were the options that I saw for women. So out of those five, I saw how miserable my mother was as a wife and mother. I, uh, I couldn't, I hated, oh, you could be a nurse. I hated the sight of blood. I didn't want to do that. I tried to be a teacher. I, I taught with mime, and then I was going to go teach in the middle schools. And once I started teaching, I said, this is horrible. You teach all these classes, and it's like grueling. I said, no, I, I'm, I've got to stick to this acting thing, and that's when I moved to New York. I mean, I, I you know, studied acting uh, at the University of South Carolina, and I had been in plays since I was, I did my first play when I was five, but I didn't know anything about acting. They didn't teach, you know, like you come to New York, and hello, it's a whole different, yeah, that's, I had to kind of escape to New York City. I was on the run. Yeah, you did stand-up comedy in New York at that time, right? Oh, no. After the divorce, I did stand-up comedy. When I turned 40, I, yeah, and that was my freedom from all that. I, oh, a woman with a microphone. People were going to have to listen, unlike my ex-husband, who did, never listened to me. Okay, so you guys are going to listen to me because I have a microphone. So, yes, I did stand-up comedy. It's really scary. Did the divorce fuel material for the stand-up comedy? <laughs> Absolutely! Oh my gosh! It was the best! And I remember going, I was doing stand-up at this, um, a bridal shower. And I was like, don't get married. You better, do you have a prenup? Does he have a job? What does he do? I mean, I was grilling her so hard, and they were laughing hysterically. And then later I thought, wow, that was really <laughs> <laughs> Really, like, don't do it. Yeah. But um, yeah, it fueled a lot of good material. Yeah. Uh, who were some of the d directors that you worked with over the years? Well, Oliver Stone was my first um, acting job in a um, major motion picture. On uh, did the movie Wall Street, the first Wall Street, the Wall Street that was good. Um, d did that with him. Um, Curtis Hansen, who just uh, who did L.A. Confidential, who just passed away last week. Uh, I worked with him on um, Too Big to Fail. Actually, I worked with William Hurt because I was I was hired as his... Well, I was hired to run lines with him, but I turned into his consultant because they didn't have anybody that they had hired to do research to these actors about all this financial meltdown and uh, global meltdown and what all these terms meant and everything in the script. And I mean, the first time I worked with William... I, I, you know, I, I called him and I said, should I bring my computer? And he was like, why would you bring your computer? I go, well, I, I read the script. Do you know what all these terms mean? He goes, oh, yeah, bring your computer. <laughs> so I ended up, but then it too much, took too much time. So I ended up coming home and I would do all the research and I would look up every word and I would do all this stuff and I would write it up and I would type it up. I would do timelines and then he would pass it out to the other actors and so I became like their, you know, uh, consultant. And I had been, I don't know, I was fascinated by that whole meltdown. So I had been researching it on my own. And then I got that job. It's like the universe said, really? Well, if you want to do this so badly, here's this job. And so I did the job. I worked with William for like 10 weeks. And then they called and said, hey, do you want to do this part? And I was like, yeah. So I did a little part with Tony Shalhoub, which was really fun. And um, and you worked uh, yeah. with Darren Aronofsky. You know, I did, but I, I, uh, he likes me. I did. I uh, uh, Black Swan. He hired me as like the. Um, I was the head of the ballet company, I guess. 
um, technically, not like one of the dancers or anything, but it was just a featured part. I didn't have any lines or anything, but I worked on the set a lot, and he was very nice to me and very... Um, He's a great guy. I mean, he's just so, I don't know, he's a wonderful, creative artist. Well, you also have been on numerous episodes of Law & Order. So you got all those directors who have uh, who have worked on that show. Yeah, I started out doing extra work on Law & Order because, you know, everybody on the mothership, the original Law & Order, and everybody hated that show in terms of um, uh, background actors. They were like... They don't feed you, they don't do this, they're really cheap, blah, 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 but I didn't care. I just wanted to work, and they just kept calling me, and then I started standing in for the medical examiner, um, <clears throat> and I, you know, on Law & Order, they make you, I don't know, you know, they made you read the lines, which you're not even supposed to do, but I was like, oh, okay, well, if, and, and do all the blocking and everything, like, you have to really pay attention and do exactly what your person did, and so... I would do that, and then one day, uh, one of the um, directors, Constantine Macris or Gus, uh, was like, "Wow, that was really good." And I was like, "Really? I have no idea what I'm saying. What, is it? what do these <laughs> medical terms even mean?" And he was like, "Well, it sounded really good." And I'm like, "Okay, thanks." And then he started bringing me in to audition uh, for parts. And um, the third time I auditioned, I got, you know, I booked my first one on there. I was so happy. And and it, and it was just because I had been on there and they had seen me and I was just, I wasn't trying to get a part. I was just doing the job that they gave me to do and doing it the best I could do it. So just by being there, um, I was rewarded. And most people are not rewarded like that. You can stand in for 100 years and not be rewarded. So I felt like that was really <clears throat> a nice thing. Maybe uh, they could have hired William Hurt to research your medical terms. There you go. I'm sure he would love to do that. Yes. He okay. would be like, what? <laughs> well, all this talk about being directed is a big setup to a punchline because one director that you worked with was me. <gasps> yes, I made a Lizzie Borden mini for uh, YouTube and uh, you were dressed as Lizzie Borden and I had you run down the staircase at 92nd Street and I said the word action, and I said the word cut. And in between those two, you acted. So that makes me your director. Well, wait a minute. I thought that... Am I confused? I thought that um, Shelley did that. No, you're in, t you're in, you're in two of them. You're, oh, I remember now. Yeah. In the house. Yeah, you were you were filming with Jack in the house, and, and I, I pulled right, you... That's right, at 92 Second Street. Yeah, so I directed you for about 30 seconds. <laughs> I remember now. I was like, wait a minute. I'm thinking, you know what? I totally remember now. Oh, that is too funny. Yeah, it was uh, um, The Death of Abby Borden, Lizzie Minnie number That's three. Right. Yeah, you're, you're in it for, you're the woman on stairs. That's the name of the character. <laughs> woman on stairs. Oh, that's funny. I had completely forgotten about that. Richard. So I, I stand up there in the ranks of Oliver Stone and Darren Aronofsky, and I can there you boast go. about it. There. <laughs> there you go. You knew me when, yeah. and you still know me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be there in, in October. I, I, I'm not going to miss that show. I don't know exactly which day. Really? I, I got to see it. I have to see it. Awesome. Okay, and uh, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Well, thanks for having me, Richard. I really appreciate it, and I hope everybody will come to the show. Oh, I'll certainly <laughs> spread the word. You know, we have listeners out there who are hopefully the ones who can make it to New York. I We look forward to seeing you again on the Lizzie Borden podcast in some future date. Thank you, and I look forward to um, being here again. It was great. It's always great to talk with you, and thank you for all your help and all your support over the years for uh, Lizzie Borden Live and all you've done for... For Lizzie and for me and for Jack, it's really appreciated. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Take care. You have been listening to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 6, Lizzie Borden Live with Jill Dalton. Next episode, we're going to continue with the Lizzie Borden Primer, Part 3, with author Sarah Miller.
This podcast was produced by Nine Muses Books and engineered by Mason Amadeus. The theme music was composed and performed by Melora Krieger. The Lizzie Borden podcast is sponsored by Nine Muses Books and the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. More information can be found at lizziebordenpodcast.com and lizziebordengirldetective.com. Was it all calculated?